Reading from the Bhagavad Gita, Song of God. And if I can find the first verse. Reading from chapter nine. Oh wow, this thing's falling apart. Hang on to it. Omagana Timindasya Gananjana Sulakaya Chukshuman Mivicham Jainas Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha 
ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ reading from chapter 9 text number 1 shri bhagavan vacha idam tu te gayatamam if you want to follow no no uh bhavakshami anusuya ve gyanam vigana sahitam yajgatva moksha se shubhat translation the supreme personality of god had said my dear arjun because you were never envious of me I shall impart to you this most confidential knowledge and realization knowing which you shall be relieved of the miseries of material existence purport by his divine grace of the prabhupad as a devotee hears more and more about the supreme lord he becomes enlightened this hearing process is recommended in the shrimad bhagavatam quote the messages of the supreme personality of godhead are full of potencies and these potencies can be realized if topics regarding the supreme godhead are discussed amongst devotees and quote this cannot be achieved by the association of mental speculators or academic scholars for it is realized knowledge the devotees are constantly engaged in the supreme lord's service the lord understands the mentality and sincerity of a particular living entity who is engaged in krishna consciousness and gives him the intelligence to understand the science of krishna in the association of devotees discussion of krishna is very potent and if a fortunate person has such association and tries to assimilate this knowledge then he will surely make advancement towards spiritual realization lord krishna in order to encourage arjun to higher and higher elevation in his potent service describes this in ninth chapter more matters more confidential than any he has already disclosed the very beginning of bhagavad gita the first chapter is more or less an introduction to the rest of the book and in the second and third chapters spiritual knowledge is described um, the spiritual knowledge described is called confidential topics discussed in the seventh and eighth chapter are specifically related to devotional service and because they bring enlightenment enlightenment in krishna consciousness they are called more confidential but the matters which are described in the ninth chapter deal with unalloyed pure devotion therefore this is called the most confidential one who is situated in the most confidential knowledge of krishna is naturally transcendental therefore he has no material pangs although he is in the material world in the bhakti rasamrita sindhu it is said that although one who has a sincere desire to render loving service to the supreme lord is situated in the conditional state of material existence he is to be considered liberated Similarly we shall find in the Bhagavad Gita 10th chapter that anyone who is engaged in that way is a liberated person. Now this first verse has specific significance. The words idam gyanam this knowledge refer to pure devotional service which consists of nine different activities hearing chanting remembering serving worshiping praying obeying maintaining friendship and surrendering everything. By the practice of these nine elements of devotional service one is elevated to spiritual consciousness krishna consciousness when one's heart is thus cleared of material contamination one can understand the science one can understand this science of krishna simply to understand that a living entity is not material is not sufficient that may be the beginning of a spiritual realization but one should recognize the difference between activities of the body and the spiritual activities of one who understands that he is not this body in the 7th chapter we have already discussed the opulent potency of the supreme personality of godhead his different energies the inferior and superior natures and all this material manifestation now in the 9th in chapter 9 the glories of the lord will be delineated the sanskrit words and asuyave in this verse is also very significant generally the commentators even if they are highly scholarly are all envious of krishna the supreme personality of godhead even the most erudite scholars write on bhagavad gita very inaccurately because they are envious of krishna their commentaries are useless 
The commentaries given by devotees of the Lord are bona fide. No one can explain Bhagavad Gita or give perfect knowledge of Krishna if he is envious. One who criticizes the character of Krishna without knowing him is a fool. So such commentaries should be very carefully avoided. For one who understands that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the pure and transcendental personality, these chapters will be very beneficial. So, we live in a very interesting world because there are things that are going on around us that we're not aware of. I'm talking about someone in the material concept of life. A person in the material concept of life begins with, I am this body, and things that are related to my body are mine. And this is mine, that's mine, and okay, that's yours, but I want what you have. How dare you have something I don't have? There's envy. And this very uh, basic characteristic of people in the material world were, were envious. And it, in some places, Prabhupada describes that we're so envious, we're envious of ourselves. And uh, to be honest, I'm really not sure how to explain that. But we're, we, we live in a place where we don't want to know what's really going on. Don't disturb me. I, you know, let me die in ignorance. I actually had a lady tell me that. I went door to door. She, she actually told me that. It's very sad. But the nature of this world is that it's built, it's designed specifically to put us in illusion. And so when we start talking about topics of God or you know, very esoteric things, people are really not ready for it, right? There's a very famous movie, <laughs> you know, uh, you can't handle the truth. Anyone who knows this line? <laughs> uh, we, we're, we are in conditioned life, unfortunately, more or less envious of the Lord. If someone suddenly walked in the door who had everything, you know, I mean, it's like, you name it. He had the best car, the best, you know, every, best of everything. The first thing is like, who is this guy, right? We want, because we have come to this world, we have decided that I want to be a Lord. And this world, this material world is inferior to me, it's dead, but I can, I can lord it all. I can, I can go to a place where I can be the Lord. And here we are. We, we don't have the, the capability, as tiny, tiny souls, we don't have the capability to, to influence matter. So Krishna has to make a world, or make an arrangement by which we can have a body. It's kind of like those, those movies, you know, where they have the, the transformers or, you know, they have some cyborg or some machine and then somebody climbs inside it and all of a sudden they're pulling the levers and becoming, you know, much more powerful and capable than they were before. So it's kind of like that. We are we're extremely small. So our capability is that we, we can only do something or think we're doing something by being an illusion. That's the thing. We can't, by our nature, we are servants of Krishna. So in order for, to satisfy our desires, and Sri Prabhupada gives the example, that the child wants to touch the moon, but obviously he can't touch it. So he's crying, oh, so the parents bring out a mirror. So he sees the reflection, and, oh, I, I can touch the moon, right? So that, that example is given, that to become like God, okay, the arrangement has to be made for us in order to do that. Illusion has to be there, okay. So more or less, coming to this world means that we want to kick that guy out and become Krishna ourselves. So 
Krishna consciousness means to do a 180. As they say, turn over a new leaf, right? Okay. When you've done something wrong, maybe you did some criminal activity and you went to jail, okay? And hopefully, by that bad experience, um, you won't want to do that same thing again that got you in trouble, okay? So, a penal institution, the material world is actually compared to a prison. And we don't, I mean, I don't think anybody here is thinking consciously that I'm living in a prison. Okay. We are free to make our own choices. I mean, there are people, unfortunately, who are incarcerated, but um, we're not thinking like that. But actually, if you think about it, we're not free. We're not free not to die. We're not free to not to get old. We're not free to not get sick. And um, we're not free to avoid being born unless you become liberated and you stop the whole thing. Okay. So we're living in this place. It's more or less like a prison. And when, you know, nature calls, you, you got to answer the call. Um, and so life goes on, but we think we're free. We're not free from the karma of things we did in the past, right? We may have grown up some friends who, you know, had a silver spoon, or maybe we had a silver spoon, or maybe we grew up in a, in a difficult situation, a broken family, or perhaps some, uh, whatever it might be, a, a health challenge or something like that. Perhaps we've got some, some, some things going on. A whole smorgasbord of things, all due to what we've done in the past. Okay, we're the architect of our own future. So as we choose, right, as you sow, so ye shall reap, right? You put the seed in the ground, the seed grows. And so the karma is like that. It's like a, you, you plant a seed, and eventually it starts to grow and produces fruits. And then we suffer or enjoy the qualitative, you know, uh, characteristic of what, we, of what we've done. If you do things that are very meritorious, uh, you get your good karma for that. And if you do something mean-hearted or selfish, and then you get the bad karma for that. And so our life is one after another, one circumstance after another. We are enjoying or suffering the choices that we've made. Okay. So there's a, there's a lesson there. Everything has a lesson. And the lessons can be on different levels, too. Right? So if you walk through a dark room and there's a set of skates on the floor and you trip on it and fall over and break your leg, okay, you can say, well, it's the fault of someone who, who put the skates there. Or is it your karma that somehow or other there's some other reason, there's some higher reason, some backstory to why you happen to walk into the dark room and trip on the skates. So... There's all kinds of things, you know, in our life that are confusing. We, we don't understand why, you know, why me, right? I know I've been there, you know, I'm a fair weather friend. If something bad happens, well, why me? You know, it's a question of punishing me. Well, yes and no. Because the, the, the governor doesn't want people to go to jail. But there has to be some kind of, uh, shall they say, a stick. You've got the carrot on one side and the stick on the other. Sometimes you need a little slap. Sometimes you need a big slap. Uh, but there is a lesson to be learned. And ultimately, the lesson is that we have to give up trying to enjoy in this world. Okay. But on one hand, if I say, oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, well, what are you talking about? You know, that's my enjoyment. <laughs> I like to do this, I like to do that. This is, you know, I'm here. You know, here's the opportunity, right? But what we don't see is that when we reach for that thing, when we desire to enjoy, it's like a, it's like a bundle, right? You buy something, right? It comes with this other thing that you would want together, 
right? So it's bundled. The more we want to enjoy, the bundle is suffering. The bundle is disappointment. The bundle is some circumstance that we didn't plan on, right? Okay, with, oh, you know, we'll get married, you know, some girlfriend, we'll get married, we'll have kids, you know. But then you get into it and they realize, well, this is a lot uh, more complicated and difficult and everything than I planned on. Okay, so this is the way this material world works. It's designed that way. Okay, it's not designed really for our enjoyment, but for our reform, right? So if you follow the rules and regulations, you're a good person and you, you, you're not um, doing anything wrong, you follow all of the laws, and you do some religious activity perhaps or some kind of welfare or something like that, well, you can be rewarded. There's the, the carrot, okay, you can go to heaven, right? And enjoy fabulous, you know, circumstances, beauty beyond imagination, everything big, big, big. Everyone's opulent, has, you know, everything you could possibly want. But in the end, because even life in heaven is not eternal, you have to return. Even you can become Lord Brahma, you have to return. Come down to the, to the earth again. And then the danger is along the way, you might go to heaven, you might do something wrong and end up having to go down to the lower world, maybe even to hell. So this phantasmagoria, this is called material existence. And what Krishna is telling Arjun is meant for us. This is, this is Krishna telling us through Arjun. Right? And Krishna says that because you're not envious of me, Arjun, I'm telling you these things. Okay? So this is very confidential. People say, well, if there's a God, how come he doesn't show himself? I mean, how come he's just like, you know, walking down the street? How come I don't see him? I don't believe he's there. He has, I, he, there's no relevance. I don't, I don't see him. I don't know anything about him. Okay, I go to church, maybe. You know, I believe in God. Um, but how come we're not seeing him? It, it, it seems like, you know, so many people are atheists. They say, well, you know, I prayed to God, my, that my, my soldier's son or, you know, uh, brother or someone went off to war and I prayed to God, right? And then he didn't come home, he got killed. So what kind of God is this, right? We don't like this kind of God. There must not be a God, right? So, these things are going on, okay, because we are in a state of illusion, and we are, we're, we're kind of, it's kind of sick. We have a disease, and that disease is envy of Krishna. So what to do about it, okay? Krishna does come. He came 5,000 years ago, and he came only 500 years ago. 500 years ago, that's like the last moment. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came 500 years ago. Because when Krishna spoke about Bhagavad Gita 5,000 years ago, it's like people weren't, weren't understanding it. They weren't accepting it. So Lord Chaitanya came and showed by example. He didn't come as God. He came as a devotee of God to teach us how we should be devotees, right? And even though he's teaching, just like a, a teacher's writing ABC on the board, but he's not learning it. So we should never think Lord Chaitanya is like us, like, you know, just some, some saint. If you go to India, some people think like that. Well, Lord Chaitanya is Mahaprabhu, you know, just a great saint or a great whatever. We should understand that these are all attempts to bring us up, to enlighten us, to tell us what the real situation is. Okay, so when you go into a school, right, and somebody wants to teach something, you have to start from with, with people from where they're at, where the kids are in first grade. You can't start writing something advanced mathematics 
You have to start with one and one is two, and two and two is four, and that sort of thing, right? Something very basic. Later on, okay, you can introduce those things. So in the science of Krishna consciousness, there's a lot. It's like learning some kind of science. It's like you, you, know, you, have, to, you have to gradually build up to it, right? They might have you know, some, some classes in, in, in basic science, but we're talking about you know, advanced you know, uh, physics, nuclear physics, and that sort of thing. There's a lot that you have to know. One built upon the other. So in order to understand Krishna consciousness, we go out in the public and we just chant Hare Krishna. And if somebody wants to know what it's all about, then we have books. And Prabhupada said that as devotees, we should know how to preach. We're not just chanting and dancing like, like uh, you know, some kind of sentimentalist. And Prabhupada was giving a lecture. He said that Prakashananda Saraswati uh, was criticizing Lord Chaitanya. Oh, he's just a sentimentalist. They're just chanting and dancing. He should be studying Vedanta, right? So one of Lord Chaitanya's devotees was very aggrieved and said, well, you know, what are we going to do? No, we'll... So they, invi these, they invited Lord Chaitanya to come and attend some of their, their, uh, their meetings. So Lord Chaitanya went there and he uh, sat down where the shoes are. Right? Like, like in the hallway. I said, what are you doing standing here? Come on, come on, sit with us. And so they finally, you know, invited Lord Chaitanya. How, you know, you're, you're a sannyasi. How come, uh, how come you're chanting and dancing? So then Lord Chaitanya started explaining uh, what he was doing. Okay, and he said that your explanations are like clouds covering the sun. What are you you know, you're talking about all these things, but you're not including the Supreme Person. And uh, he convinced all of these Mayavadis, they, they uh, Prakashananda Saraswati had 60,000 disciples, and they all surrendered. They all became devotees. So the point is that we have to start off at some point, okay, just chant Hare Krishna and see, if you chant five minutes a day, you'll see the difference in your consciousness in a week. That's what they told me when I first started. And so I tried it, and it, it, it seemed to work. So you have to start off with a little bit of faith. I'm sorry I'd use the F word. <laughs> F-A-I-T-H. <laughs> we can't live without it. But you have to find the right source. So, in order to learn something, okay, you have to find some authority in it, okay? So, in the beginning, we start off very simply. When Prabhupada came here, he didn't introduce, you know, four regular principles right away. He said, chant Hare Krishna. And then later on, it kind of, you know, well, you know, you shouldn't be eating meat and you should not take intoxication, which was, at the time, Practically the staple of every, you know, young person, uh, you know, rock and roll, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, whatever the rest of that is. So uh, we, we want to attract people, but at the same time, we should know what we're doing, why we're chanting Hare Krishna, what is this all about? You know, we have a basis. We're not, we're not simply some sentimental people. I mean, I remember seeing the devotees in front of the Aztec Lounge at San Diego State. What in the world are these people doing? They're completely nuts. They're wearing face paint and robes and playing these finger symbols. And <laughs> they must be intoxicated. This, 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 this is the strangest thing I've ever seen in my life. But there were other because uh, I lived in the dorm, I was hearing all these things. And one guy said, well, you know, there were some, some of the, the ladies that were going around you know, passing out some literature, and they seemed to know what they were talking about. There was very intelligent people over there. And I'm like, well, who am I going to believe? You know, <laughs> of course, I believe the first one. But 
we are not simply chanting and dancing and being a sentimentalist, um, you know, being weirdos on the street. We actually have the highest knowledge. And this is hard for, for people to understand. In other cultures, okay, when someone's a, a, a renunciate, wearing robes or something like that, it's not, I mean, it's just normal. This is, you know, people with their shaved head or whatever, the monks or something like that, it's, it's obvious. But in America, we've never seen this sort of thing. And sometimes there's, you know, some, some uh, uh, idea is that maybe we shouldn't be wearing dhotis, we should wear normal Western clothes and not be so Indianized and things like that. But that's our, that's our brand, right? You see the, 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 uh, the Sikhs, right? They're, they're also, um, I, I believe they're also like, like uh, Chatriyas. They're, they have some Vedic uh, basis. But you know, they're, they're wearing their turban and they're wearing their robe or that sort of thing. It's like, oh, okay, well, that's cool. I think many people nowadays are, are more used to seeing Hare Krishnas, but whatever the story is. But we're not going to change. This is our brand. This is, this is who we are. This is what, what we do. Okay. So the first thing we have to understand in spiritual knowledge is I'm different from my body. How's that? It's very difficult to act on a spiritual platform. Very difficult. Because we're conditioned. Okay. All right. I, I can understand theoretically that I'm a devotee of Krishna. But what do I do now? Okay. And Prabhupada is describing here hearing and chanting. Right. All these nine devotional processes. Um, hearing and chanting. Hearing is very important. Chanting, repeating what you've heard. Remembering, serving, worshiping, praying, obeying, maintaining friendship, and surrendering everything. As, as time goes on, these, these processes um, become more part of our, 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 our life, right? All of these things are, you know, there, there are commonalities to other religions also, obviously. So there's practicality also. We have to earn a living. I live outside. I have a probably would have described what I do. Um, I do that to make a living, but this is my life. Okay. But we have practicality. If you work, there's going to be some result. Hopefully, you make some money. If you have a business or you're, you're working. Okay, so you can use some of that to serve Krishna. You can uh, take some books home, and read, if you meet somebody on uh, friends or somebody, you can tell them about Krishna consciousness. Okay, that's chanting. Okay, it's serving. There's many things that can be done around the temple. Um, you know, some devotees are making flower garlands or, or different things. You know, uh, landscaping or whatever. Um, pray. Uh, there's so many nice prayers. Uh, maintaining friendship. Maintaining friendship with devotees. Okay, this is very important. We as a, a group here, our relationships between each other are really, really important. This is our kind of like our extended family. And this is the, the success of any religious institution, is the relationships that we have between each other. Okay, if you go to a church and everyone's cold, it does it. It won't. It won't blossom. Okay, but if we have good relationships between each other as as devotees, Jai Prabhu, we, we appreciate each other's. Maybe someone is you know maybe not. You know, maybe not advanced, but we appreciate every single person. That if you walk in this door. You're not, an, you're not an ordinary person. That, that's another thing. Anyone who chants Hare Krishna is not an ordinary person. Okay. You take someone off the street, if they chant Hare Krishna, immediately they're elevated. Okay. And that's why we go out and chant in public. Even if by joking someone chants Hare Krishna or they 
dance around and make, make a joke out of it. Um, that's also accepted, right? So our, our life is somehow or other trying to advance ourself and trying to help others and trying to relate and make friendships with devotees and with Krishna. Krishna is our real friend. Krishna is the best friend, okay? And there is no reason. Krishna could just say, totally do. Go to the material world. Stay there forever. You know, suffer. <laughs> See if I care. <laughs> but Krishna is, is a person that's like, Every part of your body, right, is important to you. If you have a hangnail, if you have something wrong with yourself, then that captures your attention. It's like, wait, you know, I, I got to do something about this. So even though we have got our independence, we can, we can decide not to serve Krishna. But Krishna is always trying to send some way that you can reform, some way that you can come back, right? Sometimes we go off and do something, you know, somebody runs away from home, probably, you know, even the Christian, Christianity has the, you know, the prodigal son, son goes away, right? And then, you know, somehow they get reunited. So we're all like these renegades, we've run away. And we, we suffer so many things because of our, things that we do and ignoring the, the good uh, good advice of the scripture and 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 uh, devotees of God we get ourselves into trouble okay but it's not like when some uh, uh, religions where you go and confess and then it's all wiped off in a clean slate and go out and do it again on Monday <laughs> that's not the idea the idea is that we we try to find a higher taste. And this is the real secret of Krishna consciousness. This is why this movement will eventually uh, uh, take over. Because we have something better. Okay? If chanting Hare Krishna okay, gives you a higher taste, and this is what I experienced when I, the devotee was telling me, chant Hare Krishna for five minutes a day, all of a sudden, the other things I was doing, which I don't need to mention, um, suddenly just sort of like lost the taste for it. And I realized that if I'm going to taste from chanting, I'm going to have to like choose. I'm going to have to like put those things down, right? I'm going to have to like put those things away. And that's how Krishna consciousness gets into your life because you realize there's a higher taste. There's something that I want. I want to be happy. We all want to be happy. But the things that we're trying to do to be happy aren't working. They never will. Okay, you get some pleasure for some time. Maybe you get some fame. Maybe you become a rock star or whatever it is. Okay. But eventually, in the end, because we can see Somebody's some big star, you know, they, they're on their deathbed and, not, and they're asking, you know, is that all is, there is about life? Is there anything more? Pretty sad. People who have it all. And there was uh, one man, a comedian, and I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about, um, committed suicide. He was loved by the world over, but he wasn't happy. Something in his life was lacking so much. And I believe he also did have some devotee association along the way. So even though suicide is not a good thing at all, hoping that this gentleman got some benefit. But we're looking for some happiness, and by the simple process of chanting, the happiness that we want, which is within us, starts to come out. That's what we're looking for. And that's what, in the, when Srila Prabhupada was here, why this movement spread so quickly. Because there was, we had someone showing us 
We had so, and, and Srila Prabhupada was very personally engaged with every single one, every single devotee. They all felt welcome. They all felt the love. And they felt impelled to reciprocate that. And that's what Krishna consciousness is all about. This is how Krishna consciousness is spread. Okay? Between each other. And seeing people not as a superior or looking down, you know, uh, that, you know, I'm a devotee and you're a non devotee, you know. This is all like we're, these are, we're all family members. We're all family members. We're all, you know, someone comes here, it's like, it's like this extended family that we never knew we had. And this is how people, they give their hearts. This is where we break down the, the, uh, the doubts. Here's someone feeling something. He's happy. I want to be like that guy. Right? If someone, you know, would preach one thing, but we're all, you know, <laughs> dour, you know, that's not very attractive. But when someone becomes a devotee, they naturally become jo jovial, become happy. Right? And that's what people want. That's what we're, we're starving for it. Because the real truth is, if someone is not serving Krishna, if some living entity is not serving Krishna, it's like being cut off of a, like a branch or, or a leaf cut off from a tree. You don't get the juice. And that's what the material world is all about. You walk outside, outside the door, there's all kinds of advertising, you know, the radio and the TV, and, you know, buy this, eat that, you know, go here, looking for the happiness that they know they want. But they're not getting it because they're missing the real point that this supreme person who is so incredible, so loving, so everything, so all attractive, that's what the name Krishna means, that we have this person here and everything is related to him because directly or indirectly, there is nothing other than Krishna. There isn't anything else. The material energy we're sitting on is coming from Krishna. The bodies that we have is coming from Krishna. This material world is all just a combination of material elements and souls impregnated into it. And there's all these kinds of activities and things going on and politics and right and wrong and duality. Where there's no duality, in fact, if you have the consciousness, then there is no material world. It's all spiritual. But we're using it not to serve Krishna, and therefore it becomes material. That's the only difference. So this is the secret. This is an open secret. An open secret that the reality is that there isn't anything but Krishna. Just like using a, like you could take a screwdriver, right? You just use a screwdriver, and I, I need to, you know, use it for something else to pry something, or you know, or a knife or a chisel. If you guys know what I'm talking about, <laughs> have you got the carpenter? <laughs> if you use the tool for the wrong purpose, you'll wreck the tool. <laughs> okay, so the gifts of Krishna. This whole world is only meant for one thing: to be used in Krishna's, everything to be used in Krishna's service. That's what Lord Brahma realized, is that this whole existence is only about serving Krishna and everything that we see around us is meant to be used for him. We do have our relationships, our families, we have things that we need to do and that's why there's Varnashra. All the activities in the, in, in the former ages, there was Varnashram where the whole society is organized. There's a working class, and you have your mercantile class, and you have your administrative class, and you have your intellectuals, okay, all harmoniously working together for what? To please God, okay? That's the whole point of sacrifice. And what we don't understand is that 
all sacrifice is meant for Krishna. Okay? People think, well, you know, I'll give charity. You know, I remember going to church and there was one gentleman who always gave the most and he always sat in a certain spot up in the front, you know, and his pull out a big, back when the dollar was worth something, you know, a big dollar, and, you know, put it in the, you know, so we don't want to be, we don't want to be famous, or we want to be recognized, right? Uh, so, when are they, these, are, these are motivations, which is okay, but ultimately, the real motive should be, am I pleasing Krishna, or am I pleasing the representative of Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, or his representatives? That's the whole point. So, coming directly to Krishna, just like in the, the, the Christianity, is that no one comes to the Father except by me. So, in a similar way, we say, well, we need to have a spiritual guide. We need someone to show us the way. Someone who has been there and done that. Someone who has realized. He's not just, you know, do as I say, not as I do but someone who is doing what he says, showing by example. And of course, that is, of course, Srila Prabhupada. And we have other wonderful examples of devotees who have accepted um, disciples, disciples of Srila Prabhupada, doing what they say, okay? So, Krishna is the ultimate person. It's kind of like going to a, a business and expecting to go in and see the CEO. Actually, in India, <laughs> it's much easier. <laughs> but in America, you wouldn't expect to, you know, just barge in on the, you know, some big, big person. So Krishna is the ultimate person. And he's very pleased when someone is going to his devotee. He's very pleased to see that his devotee is being honored. And the truth is that this whole so-called material world the whole illusion can immediately be lifted. Krishna can do that. But we have to become qualified. So there's a process. We, you know, it's like when someone's you know, uh, going through the reform process, or when you're sick and you go up trying to become well. The doctor gives you a prescription, right? Now you take this pill, and you avoid this and avoid that, right? So you can't do thus and such that you like to do for, for a while because you need to get well. Okay, so we don't like the re restriction, but ultimately it's for our good. Okay, so material enjoyment, if something happens and you feel happy from some material circumstance, it believe that the next moment something else is going to happen, you know, some uncomfortable situation may happen. So happiness comes and goes. But if we waste our time and energy trying to glom on to those things that we want and trying to avoid the things that we don't, then that's not the proper use of our time. It will not work. If something, you go on some trip or somewhere and you have a great time, you think, well, I'll do it again. But then it's never, it's never the same, right? So material enjoyment comes and, and, and goes. But the real enjoyment is in connection with Krishna, okay? To want to please Krishna or Krishna uh, reveal himself and reveal our, our, our eternal relationship with him, we first have to undergo the process of reformation and to understand who we really are and act in that and as we advance more and more, then Krishna will reveal more and more about our relationship and what we're supposed to do. But that, in the beginning, we have to find a spiritual teacher, find a guru. Okay? And it's not that it's just anybody can be a self-made guru. Like, do it yourself. I read some books, and, you know, <laughs> you declare yourself a spiritual master. No, you have to have a spiritual master who comes into the civic chain. So that chain comes from God. Where are we getting this information? People say, well, there's, you know, why, why, you know, why should I believe you? It's just, you know, you're getting from a man. Some man wrote the book. 
right? You call it a scripture, but you know, it's like it's just a, another book. I could write a book, right? Where are you getting information from? Okay, we're getting information coming down to us. It's not an experimental, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstrap sort of thing. It's not empirical. We're ultimately getting this knowledge from God. And Lord Brahma was instructed by Krishna from within. And it, that, that the Vedas are coming down from Lord Krishna through the disciplic succession. And therefore, we know that it's bona fide and it's true. Okay, so you bring out the hook. <laughs> I have a question. Yes, it's probably. Jai Pavamanas, again, a, a great discourse, and we're so glad you became inspira inspired when you sat down. <laughs> um, I get inspiration from you. In the very beginning of your uh, discourse, you mentioned the difficulty in trying to explain this phenomenon that we can be envious of ourselves. And I started thinking about it, so I wanted to pass something and share and ask for Please. your understanding and does it make sense. So because we've learned from Srila Prabhupada that we came here because we became envious of God and we turned our back. We came here to try and enjoy separate from Him. And we've lost our love and we need to now, in the process that Prabhupada has given us, to regain our love for Krishna and Guru. And simultaneously, that also means that we regain our love for ourselves. Mm. And in your discourse, you mentioned how we can practice the process and give up the activities that are for sense enjoyment and instead replace them with activities that are for bhakti, yes. service to Krishna and Guru. So isn't it, in, isn't it in the same way that as we become more loving for Krishna and Guru, and then we become more loving for ourselves, we are replacing the envy that we have for Krishna and Guru and ourselves with love. Mm. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Yes, yes it does. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Just wanted to be clear. I didn't want to think it and believe it and follow that without hearing from you. Because you're, you're a learned family member. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm just another guy. <laughs> no, you really are. You know, the, the, I appreciate you. Thank you. I, I, you know, when, when I, and it's just like, um, when I look around the room and I, I, I look at people, and I, you know, you kind of get that little gleam in the eye, a little... <laughs> <laughs> your best friend is someone who laughs at your jokes, right? <laughs> so, uh, thank you for, for that. Yeah, Hare Krishna. Jai Prabhu. Yeah, I was also uh, thinking of uh, mentioning something about that, being envious of ourself. There's different types of, of envy, just like sometimes someone will see something that someone else has, and oh, I wish I had that, you know. Yes. But also, when someone has something that you want, uh, sometimes they want to harm the person. Yes. It's like politicians, the uh, uh, personal personality defame, they just, you know, knock them. And, and sometimes, you know, there's so much envy that one person will kill another person. Yes. So if we're, if we're envious of ourselves, we do things that are harmful to ourselves. Mm. Just like we have these four regular principles. Now, if someone doesn't know about them, well, then, you know, they're, they're, they're ignorant of it, but sometimes even people know, I shouldn't be doing this, but they do it anyway. Mm -hmm. They're harming themselves, so they're envious of themselves. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes, uh, I've, I've seen people, they're, they're called cutters, and they cut their, their arm, or they... Right. So they're, they're envious, of, they're hurting themselves. Envious of themselves. Mm. So when we do things that are harmful to ourselves, then that's envy of ourselves. We do things that are, that are helpful, that are good for us, that's as he mentioned, this is love. If we're doing things that are, that are beneficial for our spiritual growth, that's showing love for ourselves. But if we do things that are harmful to ourselves, that's envy of ourselves, or harming ourselves. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, interesting. A little <laughs> interesting. That's, um, when you when you first uh, brought up about different kinds of envy, Papa talks about the difference between jealousy and envy, and that's what you're talking about. You know that, that you know that, that someone shouldn't have something that you know that I want to take it away. I'm going to harm this person. You know. I mean, somebody drives down the street with a, you know, Maserati or something, you know, somebody's into cars, like, wow, I should like to have that car. But then, if it goes beyond that, that, you know, how dare this person be driving this car or whatever, you know, I'll smash it or whatever. But uh, envy, you know, the, even, even the animals, that, you know, have pets. If you pet one pet, the other animals are, are envious. <laughs> Pet me. <laughs> so we're here and we're on our way. And gradually these things will fall away. That's the, the that's the proof of the process. That we're here for so many some, someone came for a day or a week or a month. You know, sometimes we have these groups, the chakra groups, talk amongst ourselves, and someone who just got a book two weeks before, you hear them speak. It's jaw-dropping because they're saying things that I would expect to hear from the devotees who have been around for years. Okay, it is the truth. It's simply being revealed. Okay, the happiness that we're looking for is within us. It simply has to be manifested, and that it, the process works. And that's why Krishna consciousness will eventually take over. All of the other things, or the religions, of course, they'll all be, always be there because before you can even start. School. You have to go to preschool. Sometimes, you know, just bring someone up from the gutter. Okay. I, I don't want to say uh, anything derogatory about other other religions or other people, um, but when you get to the top, when you get to the top of Cole's Hill, Cole's Mountain, you can see 360. You can tell where everybody's at. So we're not envious of anyone, and or the religions or, or, or worried about that because they're on their way too. It's just, it'll take time. So, uh, anyway. Thank you very, very much. Hare Krishna. I'll go ahead and see you later.